in year number four. It's a yank on the footy with Craig Wessels. Let's all sit back and enjoy a chat about the greatest game on the face of the earth. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 251 of A Yank on the Footy. I'm Craig Wessels coming to you from Sandusky, Ohio, and thanks for checking out this episode. And this is my sixth episode in my series on why I truly believe American NFL fans will love the AFL. In a moment, I am going to be joined by former West Coast Eagle and Melbourne Demon and legendary NFL punter, Darren Bennett. Now, today's club of the episode are the East Fremantle Sharks of the WAFL of the Waffle. This is the club where my guest played his first senior football. Now, the Sharks' Blaine Boakhorst was awarded, awarded, I should say, the Waffle's Best and Fairest Award, the Sandover Medal for 2022. Now, this club has been around since 1898, and they play their home games on a couple different ovals, the East Fremantle Oval and the WACA Ground. Now, throughout their history, they've captured 29 different flags, and their senior group opens up their season on 7 April, facing off against the Peel Thunder at Lane Group Stadium. Now, the WAFLW side has already started their season with two wins in their first three games. And on Sunday, the April, Sunday, April the 2nd, they face the East Perth Royals. Now, the club, I noticed on their website, also has information about their 2023 East Fremantle Club Coach Academy, which is designed to help train community coaches on what it takes to coach effectively at the semi-professional level. And I think this is a really neat program that they're doing because it looks as though they're trying to get the next generation of coaches ready to to move into new opportunities, but also just to, to help even folks that maybe stay in community coaching levels to, to become better coaches, to be more effective, to help their athletes become better men and women. Uh, it looks like a wonderful program, and you can find that app, that information on their website. I do want to wish the Sharks the absolute best of luck in 2023. Now, before we jump jump into my chat with uh, Darren, I do want to let you know that he works for an organization, a company known as the Punt Factory, which has been around since 2014. And this organization works on helping to train athletes from Australia and other parts of the world as well on uh, becoming gridiron punters. Uh, hoping to connect them with uh, colleges and universities here in the United States. And they have a number of different people who have a myriad of experience working in this, uh, in this capacity with the game and helping these young people uh, achieve their dreams of, of playing collegiately here in the United States, getting an education, and uh, being able to use their skills to, to help grow their opportunities. So let's go ahead and jump into my chat with Darren Bennett. I think you're going to enjoy some of these stories. A couple of them made me laugh quite a bit. There was one I wish I had recorded that, I don't know if you'd believe me if I told you, but it was it was a very surprising, almost shocking story that he told about a trip to Toronto. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back for another one of our episodes uh, discussing why NFL fans would love the AFL if they discovered it. And I am... Absolutely thrilled to be joined by my guest. We've been talking a few minutes off air, and uh, he is a veteran of the Australian Football League and, and an absolute pioneer as, I believe, the first Australian punter in the NFL. And uh, he finished in the top 10 in goals kicked in back-to-back -back seasons in 1990-91, uh, ahead of one of the more prodigious forwards in the game, uh, Jason Dunstall, I might add. Uh He's a two-time NFL Pro Bowler, and a, in 2012 was the first player that the Chargers fans were able to select to the club's Hall of Fame. And I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Darren Bennett to the podcast. Sir, thanks for coming on tonight. Yeah, no worries at all. I appreciate it. So I was the second punter from Australia. There was a guy in the 60s named Colin Ridgway who played three or four games for the Cowboys. Okay. And, uh, so, but besides Colin, I was the first guy named, not, not named Colin that played for. There you go. There you go. So the, the, first, yeah. the first one that had some, some longevity, you right. know, and Co yeah. Colin did, Colin did not make an all decade team. He did uh, so, <laughs> you know, I, I, I appreciate you coming on. You know, I, I, 
I've spoken to uh, American footy fans and Australian NFL fans and people who do do podcasts and write about the NFL, but you are uniquely qualified playing, having played both of these games at the highest level. So I'm absolutely thrilled you're able to to sit down uh, so we could chat. Now I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about your your playing career in uh, you know in footy as well as in the NFL, and then we're gonna you know touch on what can what can be you know what can be done or what suggestions would you have to try to grow the game here in terms of viewership we got a lot of people playing it but um you know you were born in sydney you were raised in perth and you know you began your professional career playing with east fremantle uh and you know as you talked about uh, off air you, you had some knee issues and you lost sounds like close to a, almost two full seasons in 85 and 86 but then came and you know had kicked 10 goals in a uh, an elimination final yeah, yeah, it was so. I I started, you know, I, I started in Melbourne, which Melbourne, you know, until I was twelve years old, we lived in Victoria, and and then we moved to Perth when I was twelve. Okay. And I, I was talking to someone the other night. I played, I did just did a uh, an event when I was home uh, last couple of weeks in Melbourne, and you know, in my little league team in 1975, I think we had five players that played AFL football in our under 11s team, and so. You know, it really was the hub of, of AFL football or VFL mm-hmm. football in those days. Right, right. So I had a really good grounding and good coaches from the start. Once I moved across to Perth, I played in the juniors and, and I had a, a, a difficult life event when I was about 15 or 16 and I took a season off football. Uh, and I was at that stage, I was one of the tallest guys. I was a ruckman. Mm-hmm. And the, the coach of my under-17s team called me halfway through the season and said, I need you to come and play. And I said, look, I, I'm really not fit enough to play Ruckman, you know. So he said, look, we'll just lob you at full forward and uh, you can just, you know, camp in the goal square. And, and I kicked 13 goals in the first game. And wow. so I played uh, from that time on, I became a full forward. You know, I think I kicked 50 goals in like four games. And four weeks later, I was playing in the under-19s at East Fremantle. So, you know, sometimes you make a decision and it goes – it changes the path of what you were doing. So, you know, I had a, a friend of mine commit suicide and it was really devastating to me. So we, you know, uh-huh. that was the reason my, my family decided to, to you know, let me spend a, uh-huh. a year trying to get through that. So, but anyway, it worked out because, you know, I played in a premiership that year as a 16-year-old in the under-19s. Mm-hmm. And then for the next season, I, you know, 1982, I started playing senior football at East Fremantle and sort of headed on from there. Wow. And see, so you had to be one of the youngest players playing at that level. I was, yeah. I played in the reserves for a start and then went up into the seniors, but I think that probably contributed a bit to my knee uh, mm-hmm. problems because I was still very thin at the time and playing against grown men at that stage. I think it really affected me and I, I tore my ankle ligaments in, in the very first game and the guy that was playing on me was just much larger than I was. And so... Mm-hmm. You know, it, I think that set me on a path with my knees and ankles that, uh, you know, but I wouldn't change it for the world. It was it was a, a great experience. And to be a senior in high school playing senior football was pretty cool. That is that is impressive. And, you, you know, you you ended up, you know, being part of the Eagles inaugural club. Um, and yeah. you had another knee issue that year as well, because if I'm not mistaken, you were limited to four games with them. Yeah, correct. So I, um, you know, I went through preseason with the Eagles, and and you know, get, even then, coming up week to week was was sort of difficult. Uh, and I was telling, I had a young punter here, an Aussie punter. We were talking about my early times there at the Eagles because he lived in Perth. And I said, you know, at the time, the Waffle and the AFL couldn't really work out what to do with the new Eagles players. Mm-hmm. And so Graham Melrose was our head coach at, at East Fremantle. And uh, I played uh, a game for the Eagles against Carlton and I, I had a pretty average game. And so they dropped me back to East Fremantle, but I was right on the verge of whether I made the Eagles team for the following week or not. And so Graham Melrose decided that if you didn't train with a team during the week, you'd have to play in the twos. And so I went from playing against Carlton to playing against West Perth in the seconds at East Fremantle and, uh, and kicked wow. 22 in the, I kicked 22 that game. Because the level of play was just so mm-hmm. different. I had a guy named Ray Sterrett playing in the resis with me who was 
one of the bo- most wonderful deliverers of the football you've ever seen. And so every time Ray got the ball, he kicked it to me and we, you know, we, we won by a mile. But the Rezies, the senior team got beaten by West Perth. And so I think that sort of changed the way the coaches looked or had to look at, you know, dealing with the, with the AFL players to come right. back and from the AFL to play in the waffle seconds was a bit of a drop, you know. So I think that sort of ended up changing how the players were seen, you know, rather that assets rather than enemies coming in to, to play yes. in your team. Yeah. And, and at that point in time, that's, I, I think that had to be then where the, uh, where the, the, the AFL side, the, the Eagles, you know, kind of, I, I would imagine there had to be a conversation that said, you know, you know, look, you're there to provide our players who are not playing with our ones an opportunity to keep their craft, you know, honed as much as possible. And yes, you went and kicked, you know, 22 goals, the next level down, but did that, would that have actually helped you when it came time to, you know, come back up to the senior side then? I mean, I would wonder no, probably didn't. Not, not at all. No, yeah. not at all. And, you know, I, years later, I, I bumped into a, a guy, I was at a pub somewhere having a beer and he came up and he said, how you doing? I said, yeah, good. He goes, I was 11 through 15. And I said, and I'm, I'm like, excuse me? And he said, yeah, he said, I was, the, I was, I was a young kid I know who was sitting on, the, sitting on the bench at the resis. He said, I'd come up from the under 19s and they, you'd kicked 10 goals. So they said, you go play on him. And he said, you kicked 11 through 15 on me. But that's how he introduced himself as 11 through 15, which I thought was quite funny. Well, that, that I, as soon as you said that, I knew where you were going with that. Because <laughs> I, cause I yeah. mean, having, having done some coaching and having, you know, you know, having coached baseball for many years and knowing there were times where my teams were not very good and I had to have somebody out in the mound that was trying to get the other team out or at least get us to the where we where the run rule uh, kicked in where we could end the game early because, you know, we right. weren't always very good. So I knew exactly what you're talking about there. But Yeah, I felt yeah. sorry for him too, but it was we had a beer together and had a good chat yeah, after. And, yeah, and, it was, and, you know, I, I – and that that's a story that, that he's going to be able to tell when he goes somewhere – in the future that, you know, that, you know, that I, I, I played against this, this guy who was, you know, playing, you know, in the AFL, he came down and played it, you know, game against us. And, and I held him to only five goals. So he gets, <laughs> it. <laughs> you got to find the positive spin on exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. So my girlfriend at the time asked me if it was a good game. She said, did you play well today? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm never going to do that again. But it was one off. Yeah. It was great. Wow. That's so, you know, you, you you make your way over to Melbourne. You know you get you. If I'm not mistaken, you were delisted by the Eagles after that first year. Um, I was. Yeah, I went and met with the doctor, and he sort of said, "Look, I think your knee. I'd had a reconstruction at the end of that year, and I spent a whole all of the 1988 season. Mm-hmm. I actually spent it away from the team. It was it was uh, our strength and conditioning coach was a guy named Tom Hodges. He's one of the best human movement scientists ever to sort of be a strength coach at, at Melbourne. I was fortunate to have two of them. I had Chris Jones and and, and uh, Tom Hodges. And Tom said, look, I think you need time away from the game. So he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to get away. I want you to rehab, but I want you to not think about football. So he had me on a bike. He had me playing badminton. He had me dunking basketballs. And, and in the back of his mind, I was doing all the – all the rehabbing that that he needed me to do, and my legs were nice and strong. And then I went up and spent some time running on the beach up in Geraldton and soft sand, but none of it was football related. Mm-hmm. But I think what that did was it strengthened my legs to the point where once I went to Melbourne, I really uh, I was a lot stronger than I thought I would be. And I think if he'd put me into a football rehab program, I probably would have phased out of that. You know, with 18 months worth of rehab, just football rehab, I think I probably would have lost interest. So I'll be forever thankful that he that he did what he did because it was an unusual, unorthodox way to do it. Well, as as we talked about before we hit the record button, you know, we talked about those if then statements, you know, and it's and there's 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 a lot of them there that, uh, you know, and we're going to certainly get into those. So you 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 find your way, um, you know, getting picked up by the D's uh, in the uh, 80. Nine draft, no, or eighty-eight draft. Well, it's the eighty-eight draft. Yeah, it was okay. the end of nineteen eighty-eight for, for going into yeah. the eighty-nine season. Yeah, so correct. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you play with the D's for several years. You have you know some phenomenal years. You know you had you know you were I think number four 
in goals kicked one year, and I think number ten the subsequent year. Um, and you were you had eighty seven goals one year because I know I remember I did see that Jason Dunstall had eighty three, and I think he got bitter yeah. about that because a couple years later he kicked like one hundred and forty five. No, uh, that's right. John, <laughs> I think John Longmire won it the year yes, I kicked eighty seven. I think Johnny Longmire won it that yeah, year. And so. then uh, then the uh, the the dad of the the Dacos brothers was number two that year, if I read correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and he was a freak. Yeah, and yeah. so are they. They they show a lot of their father's tendencies playing football, which is terrific. So you. You, you you play with the D's for you know for a number of years and you know you you get involved at the grand final having a a, a punting competition there and uh, you win a couple tickets to come to Los Angeles and yeah. uh, you know I and I asked you you know you, did you decide but before you came to Los Angeles that you were wanting to to give the NFL a try. Yeah, so Tom Hodges, I mentioned Tom before, and my mm-hmm. strength coach at Melbourne was a guy named Chris Jones. Jonesy had been – both those guys went to Oregon and studied, you know, sports science, and okay. Jonesy would come over to training camps every year, and he was friends with Norv Turner, who Norv was a, mm-hmm. was a great offensive awesome coordinator. coordinator yep. So wherever Norv was, at, was working at the time, whether it be at Miami or whether it was at the Cowboys – Jonesy would go over and and go to training camp and he was sort of fact-finding about American football. But he came back and he said to me, look, you know, as my my knees started to wane at the end of my Melbourne time, he said, look, you're coming to the end of your running athletic career. But he goes, you can still kick like a mule. So he said, if you ever wanted to try this, I'll help you out. And and he was the guy that made a phone call for me that he got me, he got me a look at Tampa Bay, at New York, at the Jets. And at San Diego, and at mm-hmm. the time when I'd won those two tickets in the long kicking contest, I'd beaten Ben Graham, who was a 19-year-old just starting at Geelong. And um, I said to the people when they gave me the, the voucher for the tickets to LA, I'm, I'm going to use this as a honeymoon. I'm going to propose to my girlfriend and, and uh, we're going to go across. And then when Jonesy mentioned that he could get me a tryout, we had friends in San Diego and so – I had no idea where Tampa Bay was, and New York was sort of a scary place to me. So I said, "Well, look, yeah, it is to me too." <laughs> yeah. so, then, so then, uh, so then, I said, "Well, let's try San Diego," and then went to okay. San Diego to see our family friends and got, you know, we were we were on a train trip up the West Coast as part of our honeymoon time, and and uh, they called and said, "If you can get to San Diego by Thursday, we'll try you out." So that's what happened. And I and I did read that. Uh... When you got when you got to the U.S., you went out and bought a football, and then you went looking. You know, as you're traveling, you went to try to find a place to practice some punting, and you looked at a map, and you found a big green area, but uh, it wasn't exactly a place that you probably should be kicking a football. No, no, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it was it was the cemetery, in, in, and we caught a we taught, caught a, ca- a cab there, and the cab driver said to me, you know, what are you Forest Lawn? And I said. Well, we just looked at a map, and it's a big. I thought it was a park, you know. Right, he said right. Forest Lawn, so, and he said, um, "What part of Forest Lawn?" I said, oh, "Anywhere where there's grass." And he said, "What are you going to do?" I said, "I'm going to go kick a football." He goes, "You can't do that." I said, "He goes, Forest Lawn's a cemetery," <laughs> and which I had no idea. So you know, it just was a big green space on the on the map. So, and then we kicked at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, uh-huh. but. It was on the side of a hill like this, so there was no way you could be consistent. You know, I had one leg shorter than the other trying to pump yeah. the side. Of the hill. Wow. So, well, anyway, it was just and, wherever and, you could find a place to kick, we 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 did. Yes, that's. Uh, so you 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 had a tryout, and uh, the 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 first snap led to uh, well, if I'm not mistaken, you uh, you decided uh, maybe I'll catch the second one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'd never, I'd never caught a long snap in my life. And I'm actually Sam Anno was the long snapper at the time, and Slammer and I are good mates now, and and we we always have a good laugh about his first snap. And he said, you know, that's the fastest snap I think I've ever done in my life. And I said, well, it bounced right off my nose, and I shanked it five yards out out of bounds. <laughs> so I thought at, when when that happened, I thought, you know, that's that's the end of the tryout. I could see all the coaches laughing behind their hands on the sideline, thinking that was hilarious. <laughs> So I, the coach goes, you're on. I go, yeah, I'm fine. And he goes, so S- Slammer snapped me another one, and I punted it 75 yards over the fence out into the parking lot where all their cars were parked. So yeah. that, that sort of got their that okay. got their attention the there second time. And then, 
So, and then the next day, they they uh, the day before they would taken me out onto the uh, at to Jack Murphy Stadium and let me punt on the grass out of my hand. Mm-hmm. And then that that was Wednesday, and then the Thursday they had me out with slammer snapping the ball. So afterwards, Bobby Bethard, who you know rest his soul, we lost him not long ago, was uh, was one of the greatest general managers the right, NFL's right. ever seen. Absolutely. And also an outside-the-box thinker. You know, Jan Stenerud is in the Hall of Fame and Bobby Bethard really gave Jan his chance. He's from he's from Sweden. Mm-hmm. And so he's, he'd already done something like this with me. So when he when he saw me, he's like, man, you know, he said, look, I've, I've had international players before and so uh, here's, I want you to meet the coaches and here's some Wilson footballs, take them home, practice, and we'll bring you back for practice, you know, for – for off-season workouts next year. So that's what they did. That was the okay. end of 93. And uh, so then I came back in 94 and not knowing how things worked, they said, you know, give us a call after the Super Bowl. Well, you know, the Super Bowl is a massive uh, event. Right. And everyone's pretty much hung over and, and takes a few days to get over the Super Bowl. So I called the Chargers the day after the Super Bowl and said, uh, you know, I want to come over. And they said, well, no one's here. And I said, well, <laughs> what are you talking about? And so I felt like they weren't going to do it, so I just jumped on the plane and flew over. Okay. And so when I walked in the door, they're like, what are you doing here? And I said, well, you said come over after the Super Bowl. And they're like, they're like well, we meant April. We didn't mean like the week after the Super Bowl. Yeah. So anyway, that was uh, – I got to work out with the other punters and the, the backup long snappers and – I, it was extremely beneficial to me. Our, our uh, special teams coach Chuck Prefer came out, and he would he would be there during his lunchtime. So he'd be eating a sandwich or something. But he, I'll be forever grateful that he came and gave me some really you know deep instruction when we first started. And I, I think I, I I benefited from that, and I used that coaching that he taught me even today with young kids when they're learning. Now is his is his son the uh, Mike Prefer the gentleman that was just released it was just let go by the Browns? Correct. Yeah. So okay. our, Mike was in the Air Force, I think, one of the military uh, mm-hmm. divisions, and, and he would come at, to our training camps when Chuck was coaching, and he sort of interned with his dad. And then when Chuck was semi-retired or he was fully retired, when Mike first started, he was at Kansas City, and he was a, a couple of other places. Chuck would then go and sort of intern for Mike when Chuck okay. was retired at his training camp. So, no, wonderful, very knowledgeable, smart, smart mm-hmm. special coaches, both of them. Yeah, I, I think he was an officer in the Navy, if I'm not mistaken, because I, because I, 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 my my son's a lieutenant in the Navy, and I I was in the Navy back in the 1980s. Uh, yeah, so I, so I, I think, think he was yeah. in the Navy, if I'm not mistaken. You may be right. Yeah. yeah so. So, you know, I guess, you know, and I'd ask you off air, I said, you know, the bottom line, you know, you talked about, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you hadn't done the the rehab work the, the way that you had done, your career might have turned out different. If you hadn't won those tickets, your career path might have been different. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, you've had, you, you had some really, really interesting, you know, swings of the, uh, of the, the luck meter, if you will, to, that, that helped land you in some you know, ultimately in some really good positions because, you know, you went on to become, you went on to become, you know, a, a phenomenal punter in the NFL. You, you, you were, you were on the all decade team. You were a pro bowler twice. You know, it's, uh, you know, the, the, you know, you look, you find the footages of you, you know, kicking, you know, the ball that, you know, you can look, it looks as though you can count the hairs on your kneecap as you, as you've released a ball. Cause that, cause that your knee is right there in front of your face. And it's, it's just, you know, it is a, uh, I guess I have to ask, you know, do you recall who hit you the hardest during either your AFL or your NFL career? Who? Um, no, I, well, I mean, when you get hit, they're all, they're all hard in the right. NFL. Yeah. Junior Sayal probably. I mean, I, okay. I got hit at practice more than I got hit in games. You know, okay. I tried to give, give the hits rather than take mm-hmm. them in, in, in the games. Um, they put me on scout team because I was the same size as a lot of the tight ends. So they would they would line me up at tight end, and and oh, wow. when they realised you were still sort of athletic, they would they would then get you in motion, and then they would get you to try and block people. And uh-huh. you know, so my my for 
one of my one of my assignments was to try and crack block Junior Sayer, which <laughs> never worked. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, Junior would that's... run over me all the time, and Carl Moore could go. He won't even see you coming, and I go like, Junior doesn't need to see me coming. He's just going to run <laughs> over the top. He's, he's so. going to know you're there, and he's going to go right through you. Well, I mean, yeah, and it's you know, it's uh, it's. I mean, are they running a, a sweep behind you? I mean, are you there? You're basically shepherding. Yeah. You're shepherding the tailback sure. around, around the yeah. end there, and it's just <laughs> yeah. And, and it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be at walkthrough speed. But if anyone has ever known anything about Junior Sayo, he did nothing at walkthrough speed. Mm-hmm. Everything was 100%. Yes. Yes. Frenetic, and then my yeah. first year, when I had no idea what was going on, they had me rush around the outside of the tackle and they said, whatever you do, don't hurt the quarterback. Mm-hmm. But if you, you know, if you get there, just wave your hands like I would have got to you. And Harry Swain, who was our left tackle at the time, hit me in the, hand, in the chest with his hand and I landed about six feet away and I'd never Oof. felt human. Wow, I'd never yeah. felt human human power like that before it was incredible how just, strong they were it's just, so, it's just that just that quick punch into the into your, just your handed, you know, there. yeah wow and so yeah. you know that that was a power that i'd never felt in my life before and so it gave me a respect for them straight away and wow. and you know i spent the whole 10 years trying to stay away from those big fellas yeah. if i could well because it because in the uh you know, in the AFL, you were you know if i'm not mistaken about six foot five and about 230 pounds you were you know, you were one of the larger athletes out on the ground at that point in time. I mean, you know, similar to like a Tom Hawkins, you know, in, in the present day, um, in terms of, you know, size, I mean, you, you, you had, you know, you had, you know, tall you know defenders that are on you, key defenders that are on you, but still they're not that much bigger. They're not, you know, they're not, you know, six foot four and 325 pounds that are, you know, putting your, you know, your sternum through the, your, your spine, you know, with a single correct. punch, you know, it's, it, no, it, correct. it is, a, you know, it is I a wasn't big, the biggest yeah. guy in the AFL, but I was one of the bigger guys, you know, yeah. I wasn't one of the yeah. guys where, you know, coming into an NFL roster, you're one of the smaller guys that, uh, you know, and especially not knowing what the hell I was doing, you know, you just run around and get smoked by guys. So right. they've been so little kids. I mean, did they, did you ever stop and think, do they want me to be a, a to try to be the punter here? Or do they just find me because I'm I'm pretty big and and uh, and you know if they can just go ahead and beat me up and if nobody notices you know they don't know I'm here nobody's going to notice that I'm not here anymore. I mean, is, oh, does no, that rule for your mind? When, No, no. When when punt team came out, they wanted me to be there. And, okay. And I was no. That was one of the great things about about the acceptance there is when you hit a 70-yard punt, guys are like, man, there's only one person that can do that. So yeah. it was, you know, that that's how I earned my respect was to be good at my job, mm-hmm. be consistent and trustworthy at my job. And then if I had to make a tackle, throw my head in there and go make that tackle. So, no, that was, that was something that I really um, – I had ultimate respect for what those guys did every play. And there's 10 guys that put their body on the line for my leg every time. And so – no, I, my, that was my obligation was to be as good as I possibly could at it. And I felt like, you know, I, I loved my time at Melbourne. I love AFL football. But at that time, that was my first real step into what I thought was professional athletics. Uh, okay. You know, over the okay. And, you know, it's – and, you know, you were – you had the, you know, the, the size that, you know, if a, if a returner happened to – get through the you know the the initial wave of of the punt coverage team you know you you had you had a lot of practical experience making tackles in your in your previous profession this was not something that was new to you and you know the punter's like okay you 10 guys go ahead and get this and i'll i'll stay back here and kind of you know try to guide the guy towards the sideline if at all possible you you, i i did see a couple clips of, of you on youtube today where you were you were definitely in there scrapping with you know some returners yeah, and I, I prided myself on that, I think. You know, Chuck was very big on uh, the aggressive safety position, you know, rather mm-hmm. than being a passive, a passive safety. Right. And um, when he had a, a 240-pound punter, I could be that for him. So the first tackle I made was a guy, uh, against a guy named Andre Hastings at Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. and I sort of clotheslined him. And the reason I did was I had no idea what I was doing. I was <laughs> just running as fast as I could. And the week before... He'd, he'd returned a uh, punt for a touchdown against Rich Camarillo, and Rich is quite smaller than me. 
and he ran right over the top of him. And I think he thought he was going to truck me mm-hmm. the same as he'd done the week before. And then when we when we met, you know, I, I sort of went a bit high. I had if you have a look at that tackle, it's it's horrible technique, but it was yeah. very effective because it got him on the ground. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm I'm sure he's thinking, well, I guess maybe I'll return one next week then. Uh, I'll take right. one to, <laughs> after well, that. He voted, so, he voted for me for the Pro Bowl that year, so I was very, <laughs> I was very thankful. He's like, whoever that well, embarrassed me and knocked me on the ground, I'll vote for There you me, go. So, so yeah. you know, you, you you played, you know, for a number of years with the Chargers. You, you know, you played a couple of years with the Vikings as well. Um, big difference kicking in a dome as compared to outdoors? Yeah, that, so for a couple of reasons. Obviously, you know, I had a really good mentor when I first got to the Chargers. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a guy named, guy named John Kidd who John was, um, you know, punted a long time at Buffalo and he said to me, look, you know, he, he taught me so much about the technique of punting consistently and we had totally different punting styles but, you know, he the professionalism he and John Carney taught me but he said, don't try and pad your stats in a dome and don't try and pad your stats in Denver. He said, everyone goes in there and thinks, I'm going to average 50 yards today. And he said, they swing way too hard and they and they they don't do what they think they're going to do. So okay. the, the thing about domes is they all have different lighting. Mm-hmm. And so some of them, it's hard to see. Whereas like the Lucas Oil Dome in Indianapolis has wonderful lighting, very easy to play in. Some of the other older domes, most of those domes are gone nowadays, right, like right. Seattle, the King, the King Dome, mm-hmm. and uh, you know at Houston, uh, the old out, the old um, Astrodome, uh, yeah, the Astrodome. So those those are gone, but um, you know some of the other domes were fantastic to play in. So I really loved punting in pregame when there wasn't a lot of people out there. The thump you could hear the echo off the seats. Oh, cool. Uh, and it was really, you know, it was a lot of fun to play in, in, in domes, particularly, you know, when when I was in Minnesota, uh, obviously it's minus 20 degrees outside yes. some of the days. The dome was was much appreciated. Yeah, I can I can imagine. I can imagine. It's uh, so back in 2012, you had something. You know, you 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 know, you had something, you know, you were part of the Chargers like 50, you know, 50 year team. But then in 2012. If I if I read correctly, you were the first player that the fans were able to vote on to include in the Chargers Hall of Fame. Yeah, so and it, there was that that had to be a, a, a total honor. Yeah, an absolute honor. I, I think it was uh, it was fantastic to do that. There was two things that was was a huge honor. Is Junior Sale was inducted the year before me, and so my night my name is forever sat next to Junior, who I think is probably the greatest athlete I think I'd ever seen play any sport mm-hmm. uh, and the fact that the fans voted me in. So Anthony Miller, who was a wide receiver that uh, was a great wide receiver at the Chargers and Natron Means were the other two guys. And then, um, uh, and then there was me. So, you know, they, they put it to a fan vote to see uh, who would get voted in. And the fan, I was very thankful that the fans voted me in. So, you know, to be, I was only the third punter I think ever inducted into anyone's, Hall of Fame or anyone's Ring of Honor, uh, and so you know it's one of those the great honors of your life. I think it means nothing really other than the fact that the fans voted for me that mm-hmm. make, makes me very happy. But you know, I don't I don't know what a Hall of Fame is. It's like winning an Oscar; someone voted for it. But whether well, you you're a winner or a loser, it doesn't really matter. But they they thought hi, they thought enough of you to to take the time to cast those votes for you. You know, yeah. and, 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 you know, so you were, you were memorable to them and, and this is not, you know, to take any way, anything away from Mr. Means or Mr. Miller, but, you know, at that point in time, you know, those people that chose to take time to, to cast that ballot said, you know what, we think this person's career is worth, you know, recognizing, you know, we're going to, I'm going to take the time out of my day to go ahead and cast this vote for it. So, I mean, I think it, yeah, I think it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Granted, you know, that, and, you know, you know, four dollars is going to get you a cup of coffee at starbucks but it's you know it but right. it still is <laughs> yeah, yeah and i think it's still I pretty think cool honestly, you know they they'd been as much a part of my journey as i was you know mm-hmm. they they've they've all spoken to me you know during ga- you know after games and and at blood drives and and all the events around san diego so they'd understood 
you know, and they ask me the same questions you're asking me. Of where did you come from? How did you get here? What was it like to come from a different sport? And so I think a lot of those fans were as much about as my journey as I was. So mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate it and vote for it. Yeah, because because you know initially you know yes you had the uh, the the gentleman back in the '60s that was with the uh, the Cowboys for a few games, but you know this is going to come off sounding probably wrong, but you were, you were a bit of a novelty, you know, and it, and it's, you know, but, but you, you show, you definitely showed quickly you belonged there and, and you had a, a tremendous career. Yeah. And I look, honestly, um, the, the questions started, the crocodile Dundee questions, you know, they were the easy questions to ask when <laughs> I first got there. But my my aim when I first got there was to eliminate Australian from my conversation, and really what I wanted people to ask is why was you why was I one of the best punters? Mm-hmm. And so then I could bring the Australian side of the conversation in, like I learned from Australian rules football, and and this was a skill that I already had. Mm-hmm. But to, el- to eliminate the um, you know the cliche Australian questions. Right. It took a couple of years, but then they, you know, after the first Pro Bowl and then my time in NFL Europe, I think they started to just talk to me about being a punter and being a good punter. Uh, and and an aside was the fact that I was Australian as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You 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 made it. You made a name for yourself, and your performance ended up precluding, you know, where you were from. You you know, you were Darren Bennett, who was a a a Pro Bowl punter who happened to be from Australia. You yeah, were, and then you I were, and yeah, then you, I screwed it up by introducing the drop punt, and then they had to ask me all those questions again. So, <laughs> so you know, I I watched a uh, a clip of uh, of you on Twitter the other day uh, that you had posted, and it was I think it was during the Super Bowl. You were talking, you know, Savaraka was there, and you were talking about how you know you living where you live in Oklahoma now that. Uh, that you are you are kind of a a hub, almost a home away from from home, for you know many of these uh, these athletes who have come from Australia to be to be punters in the college programs here in the United States, you know, to to work on getting a college education and that sort of thing. And I and I had I had your friend Nathan Chapman on the podcast a few years ago, um, you know, who does you know very similar things to what you, what you're doing as well, and it just. I think it's tremendous because, you know, he, he commented that that eventually, you know, he thought every putter in college football was going to be an Australian putter. And I said, you're probably right. I said, there may be three that aren't, though. I said, probably not the probably not the Air Force Academy, the Naval Academy or the, you know, the U.S. Military Academy. Those might be Americans, but the other the rest of them, you may very well be right about that. Yeah. And there's look, there's a lot of Australians over here and mm-hmm. and. You know, we saw it when Sav and Ben and Matt McBriar and myself mm-hmm. were here, um, all the guys that had played in the NFL, we, w- there was a kid, one of Nathan's early guys um, got homesick and went home, gave up a scholarship at the University of Arizona. Mm-hmm. And we all sort of took it personally because we're like, if we, if we just contacted that kid, hopefully, you know, one of us could have looked after him for five minutes and he wouldn't have been homesick. And right, so... Right. Since then, we've had I've had probably over a hundred guys stay with us, mm-hmm. and you know some of Nathan's guys have stayed with us. But you know the the way that um, we have a lot of Australians in in Melbourne and and Perth and and in Queensland that have the skills to do it, and so we decided you know a long time ago that we would support any of those kids, and so we've had probably twenty. You know I know Nathan's had a few guys go in over the time and then we've got probably 20 guys that have come in the last two years Mm -hmm. uh, in our program and what they have is they use us as a central hub and I had one of them stay with me this weekend because he was about four hours away and he just was feeling like he needed you know a family family meal and a bit of a chat and a punt with me at the same time so there you go you know we had um, my son Will who uh, unfortunately uh, he had muscular dystrophy. We lost him in 2021, mm-hmm. but he was coaching. He would coach with me and have them on the on the field. So we always said, you know, they come to learn life from Will. They come to learn mm-hmm. punt from me, and they get fed by Rosemary. And you, you know, go. it gives them a comfortable place yeah. in America. And so 
when we were in San Diego, we were sort of in one corner of, of, the, of the country, but my son Thomas came and punted here at Tulsa and we quickly realised being in the middle of the country is a great thing because none of these boys are any more than two hours flight away from us. So right, right. if they ever get that feeling, they just get on a plane, come and spend the weekend with us and then spring break, you know, rather than go all the way home to Australia, we're, we're like their Australian home overseas. Okay. So you you have a... You have a lot of people staying with you then over the over those breaks if they're if they if they're not going somebody somewhere else on break you know that's right yeah, yeah we yeah. we have them you know we'll have a bunch of them here for spring break this that's, year that is awesome that is absolutely awesome yeah it's uh and it is it it is just absolutely admirable that that you have taken on that role and, and in many ways it it's very similar to what happens with the clubs back in the AFL when those 18, 19 year old kids are drafted to clubs and uh, they end up living with, with families that are in, you know, that are like supporters of that club that are in the area of maybe of the, of the, uh, the training grounds. And they might live that with them for the first year or two as they're getting, uh, as they're trying to get, you know, them, their feet underneath them and get their career off the ground. Well, that's where this started. Yeah, you know? okay. My, makes sense. My yeah. player sponsor at Melbourne was a, a family named Barry and Joan Ravel. They always had country kids staying at their mm -hmm. house. I used to go to their house every Thursday for dinner. Um, and I had uh, uh, Harry Neesham, who was a great East Romano stalwart, the Neesham family. He took me under his wing when I was injured and, and, you know, taught me how to play water polo and did all sorts of stuff again unrelated to football but those sort of mentors that i had over over my football career that's the reason we passed this on to all these young kids because they taught me that it was very valuable to have that support so I, i'm forever thankful for those guys too i mean it, it, i and i i tip my cap to you uh for for what you're doing because you know it it, it is a i don't know how much of a a culture shock it is uh because, you know, so much, you know, I, I, so much of, you know, what is in America in terms of pop culture has, as fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, has found its way to Australia, but still that, you know, 15,000 kilometers from the Midwest of the United States to Melbourne is, is a long distance to cover, you know, if you're, if you find yourself a little homesick and, and you and your, your wife being there, you know, to, uh, to, to look out for these kids and, and, you know, your late son. And I, I read some great things about him today when he was coaching and him, you know, with the, you know, having his photographic memory and being able to help out with uh, all the different, uh, yeah, yeah. And all those types of things. It was just awesome reading about that. Um, but, you know, it is admirable that, that, that you're giving back as much as, as you are in this type of situation. That's just really, really fun. Yeah, and look, I, we had a great journey and, and a lot of fun doing what we're doing, but we had to overcome a lot of speed bumps to get mm -hmm. to where I to where I got to. So if we can help smooth those over, uh, you know, and, and Sav being our coach in Melbourne, Sav's an Aussie rules legend, played mm -hmm. 15 years in the AFL and he played seven years at Philly. Right. He's one of the really, you would never know, he's the most humble man you've ever seen, you know, and, and one of our young kids just started had three uh, sessions sat punting with Sav, and he, he said, you sort of know what you're doing. Did you play in the AFL? And Sav said, I did, you know. And so he said, what's your last name? And he said, Rocker. And he goes, are you Anthony Rocker's brother? <laughs> and so and Dwayne Armstrong, who's our other guy, that, that's uh, Dwayne's an, uh, an American guy that played at, uh, played Aussie Rules at Essendon, and he's done like the reverse of what we did. Okay. Um, had to, he goes, I had to laugh. He goes, I think that's maybe the first time Sav Rock has ever been uh, called Anthony's brother. So, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, but to have Sav, he's, Sav's doing the same thing. He's, his obligation is to pass on what he learned mm -hmm. from his AFL career and NFL career to the boys in Melbourne. And then my job is to do it when we're, when they're over here. So they have the same support, both sides of the, the Pacific. That's, awesome. that's absolutely awesome. It, it, it's almost like, it's almost like you are a, uh, it's almost like you're a truck stop on the on the punting highway. You know, we are, in a, in yeah. Way. And uh, you know, but Rosemary Rosemary bought some Aussie lamb chops the other day, and well. and uh, sauce. And our young fella was uh, super excited. And she made, you know, she makes Australian desserts or whatever. Just a, okay. a little bit of Australia over here. Well, so I, and I, we've got all the Vegemite sitting well, behind you there. We've got all the Vegemite yeah. in our pantry. Okay. Well, so. I will tell you. I will tell you. These jars over here. 
are all empty. I <laughs> bought, I start, I, I got my first jar. Somebody sent me a jar in June of 2021. And since then I have gone through 18 jars of Vegemite in nice. a little, in a little over 18 months. You Absol must be one of the few Americans that actually likes it. Absolutely love it. I, I, I only have three jars in reserve and I have one of the, the squeezy ones that I have not opened yet. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, that used to be one of my things at training camp is uh, I would get someone with it every year uh -huh. is I'd bring it out at the training table for breakfast and I'd just sit it there and you'd see someone's eyes start to look at it and they're like, is that, is that that Nutella? thing from Australia, the Vegemite yeah. thing? Okay, and yeah. I'm like, yeah. And they go, can I try it? I go, sure. And I would never tell them how to try it. And they would, <laughs> they would, they would lather. I said, you got to have it with butter. And they go, okay. So they would put butter on the toast and then they would lather it on like peanut butter. Oh yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's enough to kill a horse right well, there. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I no longer use butter and yeah. I, and I spread, I spread it on rather thick. Oh, you know, do you really? I do. Well, I do. So, and I don't use butter yeah, anymore so, with it. Yeah. And my thing is I eat Promite more than I eat Vegemite. So okay. people think, I'm crazy eating chromite because it's I'm, just a, it's a little bit of a different taste. Yeah, I've not had that. I've had the marmite once, but I've not yeah. had the I've not I have I had a jar of that. But um, yeah, I wanted to spend a little bit of time with you while I have you here. You know, to to talk a little bit about you know since you played both of these games at the highest level, you know, I I have argued that you know American NFL fans if they knew about or knew more about the AFL that they would absolutely love the game and it, you know, and it fits so well with the NFL season because, you know, it, it, it starts in mid March and it's over by the end of September. Yeah, absolutely true. And look, years ago, it was one of the games that actually launched ESPN in Correct. the, in the eighties, you know? And so I felt like a, a lot more people knew about it when I first started playing because they'd watched it on ESPN. Mm -hmm. And I think it actually is a travesty that it's not sold correctly in this country. And I think, you know, the AFL, we used to do the Foster's Cup games, the overseas uh, end of season games to try and promote the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, there should be more people, you know, uh, Nick Rewald now lives across here in Texas and he was working for ESPN uh, at the Super Bowl. Right. And I think Nick, Nick would be someone who would be a perfect ambassador for the game over here in the US. But I think it's as easy as putting it on a on an easy app like a, a ESPN Plus or something like that where you could go mm -hmm. find the games on a weekend and not make it hard because, you know, I, I think we were talking before I came on the air, but, you know, we have uh, DirecTV here and it doesn't have Fox Sports 1. For FS1, you know, the the uh, the Fox Soccer Channel or whatever it is, is sort of a more obscure right, channel. Right. And so we don't get the AFL here. So it's not an easy thing to watch. Right. And I think if they made it easier to watch, it would be easier to sell the game because there, there's 600 teams playing football over here. So there should be an opportunity for people to watch the games easily because yeah. I, I agree with you. I think Americans would love the game. And the, and the thing they 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 don't market it at all. I mean, there's there's right. I have you know FS1, FS2. Yeah, yeah. I know that uh, this year, uh, round one, they're going to have three games on between FS1, FS2. I think round two has six games on, and then round three has I think four games that are on live. But there's there's no there's nothing that shows up on like the little crawl at the bottom of the screen ever that says, hey, you know. Collingwood and Geelong are going to be playing at, you know, 4.40 a.m. Uh, Eastern time on Friday the 17th or 18th, whatever it is. Um, you know, set your DVR so you can watch it later on. Because, you you know, you, a novice fan is not going to get up at 4 at four o'clock in the morning to watch an AFL game. Now, I will, no. but a novice fan is not going to do that. But if we, if well, they... And I think there's enough expat Australians over here that would just love to watch it if it was easy to watch. Yeah. Myself, like I said to you earlier... I haven't watched a lot of, the, of AFL football mm -hmm. in the last few years. Obviously, I get the grand final and stuff like that, but it's not it's not easy to find, and you forget games are on because it's not easy to get. Right, and it's it's uh, it's a shame because yeah, you know, there there are you know, and I guess let let me ask you this: what what parts of footy feel? You know, and I'm kind of gearing these towards you know NFL fans that haven't watched the game before, but what parts of footy do you think translate to the NFL that that NFL fans would go? 
Ah, that's pretty cool. That's something similar to, you know, what I'm accustomed to seeing. Yeah, well, uh, zero. I mean, obviously the, okay. kicking, part, the okay. kicking part of it. But then, you know, you've got, uh, you, you know, you had two Australians playing the Super Bowl this year, Aaron Sipos and Jordan Mailata. Right. And, uh, you know, so Jordan Jordan is a rugby player. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, obviously he's a man mountain. So those yes. sort of guys don't, don't exist in the AFL because they just physically couldn't couldn't last a game but uh you know between we always talk about what players uh would translate across i think tight ends you could find some guys that are tight ends we have a young punter coming across who's six foot eight 240 pounds he's going to punt and i said the first thing you do is please don't let the coaches make you a tight end because they're going to look at your size and go man you're going to play tight end you know so you're you're speaking from personal yeah you're speaking from personal experience yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah don't do it. You know, if you, if, you, uh, if, you, if you smash your hands up, how are you going to hold a ball to punt it? So right. you're there to punt. Don't, please don't. Even though you're a big dude, don't, mm-hmm. don't be a tight end. Uh, and then rugby guys, I think they could become rush ends, defensive ends. Mm-hmm. I think they tremendous, have tremendous footwork and, and upper body speed and power. And the way that we've gone to smaller ends, rush ends now mm-hmm. in the NFL, I definitely think that, you know, there's some rugby players and Aussie rules players that could could fill those positions. Um, okay. of, we have a lot of fast Australian rules players, but what they don't understand is Olympic fast. You know, you could take off NFL teams, you could take a couple of wide receivers, and they would represent Australia in the hundred meters. So, you know, it's it's Olympic speed athletes. So. Right, right. You know, that's very difficult because of, we have such a huge population in the States. To have uh, a guy that has that sort of acceleration mm-hmm. is very, uh, very hard to find. Okay. Okay. So, what, you know, what do you think would be the most difficult thing for an American watching the game for the really for the first time or the first, you know, couple of games? What's the, fir- the hardest thing you think that they're going to? try to have to grasp about working out, working out when to go to the bathroom because <laughs> we have because we have no timeouts so that's the that's the problem is like trying to explain to an american when the timeouts are because there isn't uh-huh. one so our timeouts are after someone kicks a goal and they run you know if you're running a live a live program mm-hmm. when they're running the ball back to the center but if yes. you go to the bathroom you're going to miss the half of the next play so you know, it's. I think the cultural side of that was always the harder thing to explain. That you know, we play for 120 minutes. Mm-hmm. We only have breaks at the end of the quarter. The game is always live, and every player is live on the field. There's no offensive players standing on the sideline ready for offense and defensive players. So, but once you realise, you know, I think over since I tried to explain that years ago, soccer has become a huge thing in the US. Mm-hmm. So they they're yeah. used to watching a game where everyone plays. Then we have the interchange bench where guys go on and off. So I think, you know, it's an easier game to explain nowadays than it was previously uh, because other sports have sort of become more in the forefront. And so you can say, look, it's like soccer. Everyone stays on the field the whole time, you know, and it's it's like basketball when we have a centre tip. And, you know, mm-hmm. so I think if you explain it that way, people start to, to work out, okay, this is pretty cool. But, you know, a lot of the stuff has been legislated out, the, the fights, yes. the yeah. guys getting knocked out, which I think is a fantastic thing for the game. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people watch it as a, you know, used to watch it as a bit of a blood sport to see if you could see someone get knocked out. So I'm glad yeah. that that, you know, so, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful game to watch. It's evolved from when I played it. Someone of my athleticism probably couldn't play it at the highest level nowadays because it's a totally different game. But when it's played well, it's a terrific game to watch. Yeah, it's um, it, it absolutely is, and it you know I, you know I'll watch the Browns play, I'll watch Ohio State play, I'll watch the Naval Academy play, and then I pretty much just watch footy. I mean, I, I yeah. I've I've given up on you know I I grew up I was a much bigger baseball fan than anything, but I've not I've not watched a major league baseball game in three years because I'm, I'm so frustrated with what major league baseball is doing to the sport that I love. And I'm so thankful that I, that I found footy, you know, even though it is as late in life as I did, because I don't know what I'd be doing with my 
all my free time because baseball has me so angry with, with, with all the rule changes and the disparity in the league. And it, it's just really frustrating. So, well, so if, as, a, as an AFL fan, I feel the same way about the AFL because I yeah. look at some of the rules they have nowadays, you know, the 50 yard rules ridiculous mm-hmm. nowadays, you know? And so I feel like an old boomer when I look at it and go, why is there so many handballs in this game? And why, why can you not tackle a guy? And why, you know, so, so I think, you know, when administrators get too involved in the games, I think uh, I think it's it frustrates the people that have been uh, watching it for years. No. Speaking of administrators, if you if you had Gil McLaughlin's ear for a while, I mean, he's going to want it back when you're done with it. But uh, um, but if you if you had his ear for a while, what advice would you give him about trying to grow the game here? What would you suggest he do? Yeah, look, I I think you know. Uh, I think games overseas is a big thing. I think the correct promotion of the game. I think uh, injecting money into big countries like this, sporting countries that allows junior development. I think uh, a few years ago rugby did that and we've really got, and so did lacrosse, mm-hmm. and we, you know, they've turned them into uh, scholarship sports at, at, at uh, college. As soon as you turn something into a uh, where there's a, an end game for a, a kid who can extend their career and get an education on it, it becomes a thing. So I think, you know, uh, Aussie rules, uh, having Auskick programs at young, uh, especially like you said, in Washington, they have what have Auskick. Yeah, they have Auskick in the there, Washington yes. area. Yeah. You could start with the major metropolises. You know, you mm-hmm. could start with LA and Dallas and, and New York and uh, Washington, Chicago. And, and really help those sort of leagues develop. The guy that works here, Dustin Brazel, he started the, the Dallas team and then came up and started a Tulsa team because he's like, like you, he's an American that just loves footy. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think the foundation has definitely been set and uh, they just have to work out how to internationally market it because I think, you know, I, I think between – the sleeveless jerseys, the jumpers that we wear, mm-hmm. uh, and and the speed and the athleticism. And then the other way to do it, we have Americans now coming and playing footy in Australia, you know, and so Mason Cox and all those sort of guys, right, right. they need to market those guys back in America to say, look, your basketball players, your soccer players, all those mm-hmm. We can teach those kids and they can go to Australia and play. Dwayne Armstrong is a classic example. He played defensive back at Iowa State, was on the Raiders practice squad, went to Australia on a trip and ended up playing in the reserves at Essendon. So, you know, I think there is – you could do a cross-cultural thing to get Americans to go play in the AFL and that that would help market the game here as well. Okay. I mean, that's that's a great point. And I – I've always thought it would be, like I said, there's no, there's never any advertising in terms of when the games are going to be on. But I've always thought that that if one of the channels that's carrying the games could do like a, a like a half an hour highlight show on like a Wednesday, and look at highlights from like the previous round, and then maybe talk about you know spend a few minutes talking about one of the games that they're going to have televised here this week, that it would it would and have it on it like nine o'clock in the evening because you know you said you you know you've watched fs1 before and fs2 but if you know footy's on in the middle of the night but other than that you're 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 not seeing a whole lot more than you know 20 year old poker tournaments and uh lumberjacks chopping wood and uh you know and you know 15 year old ufc fights i mean that's pretty much all they have on anymore craig you know the other thing you need someone like you an American who can explain it to Americans because it frustrates me when they try to sell the grand final da, 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 and it's Australians sort of Americanizing the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think you need a local person with knowledge of the game, with a love for the game, that then uh, explains the game to Americans and understands what your translation of the American side of the game, so mm-hmm. you can relate it to basketball, baseball, American football, instead of having an, attra- an Australian, it's it's a bit like an American trying to explain Australia to Americans right? rather than having an American with an understanding of both cultures, you know? Right. That's a good point. That's a very good point, yeah. 
we we don't all have kangaroos in their backyard, and no. an Australian can tell you that. No. So I think you know, I think you would be someone, someone, an American that knows the game would be a, a person to explain it to Americans. Now, I, I I do have a gentleman I talk to quite a bit that lives about three hours to the west of Brisbane, and he has kangaroos in his front yard all the time, though. Uh, <laughs> wow, that's that's that's, good that's, good that's, good that's where he lives. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, last question before we wrap up: if there was, if there was a a classic AFL game that you would recommend that that American fans take a look at to kind of just get the the pulse of what the game is all about is there is there a specific game that might jump out at you that you'd say take a look at this one i mean uh, not really because i i don't want to see the ones with all the brawls that's see pro- that's right. the problem is i think if you right. look up afl football the first thing you get is the biggest you know the biggest yes, knockout, right. yeah the biggest, yeah the biggest brawls right yeah. so you know i watched so, a game and i can't even tell you what year it was but you know, after the evolution of the speed and professionalism of the game, there was a there was a game North Melbourne versus Geelong, and it may have been the best game football I've ever seen played. I mean, the hand to foot was ridiculous, the movement of the ball around, the the defense was fantastic, and I just sat there with my mouth open, thinking this might be the best game I've ever watched. So, wow. you know, it's I think. I think there's a lot of good football play, mm-hmm. and I think you know once people ha- are explained the game and they understand what you're trying to achieve, it's like Rosemary, my wife. Rosemary explained American football to so many people over the years that came to the games with us because uh-huh. they just thought it was a bunch of big fat guys falling over top of each other. And then when she, <laughs> when she, between her and John Madden. Uh-huh. And I, honestly, I think that's been the evolution of American football in Australia is when John Madden really started to explain what they were trying to achieve with the telestrations and stuff uh-huh. on the TV. And he's like, this guy's trying to do this and this guy's pulling out the guards, pulling to the left, and he's trying to create this hole here. And so this, I think that really changed the American game for Americans as well as international people that had no idea what was going on. Right, and we right. just need someone to be able to explain that game that what's going on in the game to an to an an international crowd, and I think the game would sell itself. Yeah, I I, I think so. Yeah, and again, I, that's why I've said if if people just would take you know take a look at it and they would go, this is awesome. This is you know the, as you said the speed you know the, you know seeing somebody taking a, a specky is just you know is just you know I I I'll show I, I'm a school teacher so I mean I'll 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 have a game on in the mornings when my students come in and they'll. You know, some of them will come to come to my room, especially a lot of the football players. They'll 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 show up in my classroom before school, you know, to to come in and watch the game that I've got on the television that I'm watching. So, and it's just and and they become very fascinated by it. And you know, we you know we've got a couple of the, the teams that play here in the state of Ohio. So, you know, we'll we'll see if it uh, we'll see if it transpires and if any of the kids get involved with it. But it it, it is just a fascinating game. You know, it's I love the NFL, but you know, I if but footy is just, you know, it's it's the one that I just spend most of my time with. And I'm and I'm so so thrilled that that people in Australia have been gracious in terms of helping me make sure that I have a good grasp of it. And you know, you've done a fantastic job of that during our discussion this evening. And I can't thank you enough for that. No, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm about to run out of battery. So if I cut no, off or something. No, you know, I appreciate but, it. I Yeah, no worries. No, that's I I want to thank my guest, Mr. Darren Bennett. Uh uh, sir, thanks so very much for your time this evening. I appreciate it. No, nice, nice to chat to you, Craig. And I appreciate, I appreciate you uh, helping educate people about Aussie rules football. I think the more people that listen, both in Australia and over here, I think it's, uh, you know, it brings our countries closer together, which is great. Absolutely, absolutely, my pleasure. Absolutely, my pleasure, sir. Cheers, Good on you, Craig. See you, mate. All right, Darren. Thanks so very much for taking time to chat with me. You, sir, are an absolute gentleman. I do appreciate your insight, and I figure if anyone has the knowledge on why NFL fans would love the AFL, it is somebody who did both of these jobs and played in both of these sports and these games at the absolute highest level. And, and I, I cannot thank you enough for taking time um, that Sunday evening that we sat down to chat. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, remember, you can find everything about my podcast over at my website, ayankonthefooty.com. You can get on the mailing list there so that when new episodes come out, that is linked and sent to you uh, very quickly. You can leave a review for the show. If you enjoy the podcast, I hope you'll uh, head over there and leave a review and let people know what you think about it so I can share that out there. I do hope you'll go to uh, you know, Apple and subscribe if you haven't done so there. It really helps the uh, search engine optimization and gets the, uh, the podcast in front of new people. Uh, if you want to help out the podcast uh, financially, you can do that by clicking on the Buy Me a Coffee button. There's a little uh, rectangle on the right-hand side and a little yellow button in the bottom left-hand corner, which you can do that with. Uh, you don't have to, but you certainly can. I don't have a uh, paywall of any sort. There's no Patreon, so everything that I publish uh, is available for you to listen to. So if you like what I'm doing and you want to help keep the lights on, uh, which much to the chagrin of my wife, uh, one of those bills came in just recently and she was uh, reminding me of the fact that I probably should let her know when that's going to be coming in. So there won't be another one of those until December, but... Uh, there was a pretty good size when they came in here just a couple of weeks ago. So also, if you uh, want to be a guest on the podcast or you know, know somebody that would be a great guest, you can leave me a note over there. You can register as a guest there as well. Now, over on my website, you can find everything related to my socials, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, my email, ayankonthefooty at gmail.com. Also over there, you know, if you listen to the podcast uh, on a specific podcast uh, platform that you are accustomed to. Now, normally when I send out the podcast, I send it out through uh, the Podbean app, which is my podcast host. And I know some of you have had to download that app and some of you haven't. That's fantastic. But uh, over on my website, I do have buttons on there uh, on the right-hand side of the opening page. And I think it's on every page, as a matter of fact, uh, with 14 of the top podcast platforms that are linked directly to my podcast. So if you are somebody who prefers Spotify or Apple Podcast or Amazon Music or Pandora or iHeartRadio or Stitcher, which is the one that I use more often than not, um, you'll find a link there and you can go ahead and book that, bookmark the podcast right there on your favorite platform. Ladies and gentlemen, please look out for one another. Check on your friends. Make sure that they are doing well. Let them know you love them. Go out and grab that coffee. It's been two crazy rounds of football so far this year. I do plan on doing a little bit of a review episode this week as well. Uh, just, it's wonderful to have footy back. Now, full disclosure, being a cat supporter, I'm still waiting to uh, see us actually put some uh, points on the ladder, but I'm sure that's going to happen at some point in time this year. But let your friends know you love them. Check up on them. And if this is your first time listening, I close out every episode the exact same way. And I'm going to do that for you right now, folks. I appreciate you tuning in. And as always, may your dribble kick never hit the post. I will catch you later. This has been episode 251 of A Yank on the Footy, my discussion with Darren Bennett. Don't forget that you can reach me at yank underscore on, on Twitter or to yankonthefooty at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook. Just look for A Yank on the Footy or A Yank on the Footy po podcast, respectively. You can find my name, Craig Wessels, on LinkedIn, on Insta or on uh, Facebook as well if you want to connect there. And I do hope you'll share this episode with your friends and family. And I do hope you'll uh, bookmark the podcast on your favorite uh, platform, and get on that mailing list so when the new episodes come out, you'll have them shortly after the podcast has been released on my platform. Thanks very much, folks. Until next time, goodbye.